Gaude amus omnes in domino. I am going the way of the fathers, for I see myself being summoned by the Lord. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilino. It's strange, this episode, to be telling the story of Eusebius of Caesarea. He's usually the man we invoke when we want to tell everyone else's story. As the father of church history, he is the great source of facts and quotes and rumors about all the great Christians who lived in the centuries before the Council of Nicaea. It was he who took the trouble to travel the Christian world and search the libraries and archives to find the evidence that could be found. Without the work of Eusebius, we would have so much less than we have. So we quote Eusebius, but we don't often tell his story. That's partly because his lot was the lot of the chronicler, who's always directing our attention elsewhere. But it's also because he was himself a major player in history and not always on the right side of history. It seems likely that he was born in the city of Caesarea in Palestine. The place had a rich Christian history that began in the pages of the New Testament. Evangelized by Philip the deacon, Caesarea was the place where the Apostle Peter first conferred baptism on the Gentiles. St. Paul lived and ministered there on several occasions, once for a stretch of two years. Eusebius spent his young life in that storied city, and that was his particular grace. The ancient past must have seemed vividly present to him. The very streets and buildings were monuments to the lives and works of the apostles. And the story continued well beyond the first generation. Caesarea was the city where the great Christian scholar Origen spent his final years, it was the place where he conducted his most important research, where he produced some of the greatest books of Christian antiquity, and where he established the church's most formidable library on earth. It was in a prison in Caesarea that Origen suffered torture till he was sent home almost dead. Caesarea remained a vital center of Christian life and learning, faithful to its legacy of witness. Eusebius was born shortly after Origen died. We know little about his early development, but we know that he passed his childhood during a time of intermittently intense persecution of Christianity. He would have been keenly aware of his own moment in history, understood always in light of the ancient and recent past. In his youth, he studied with Pamphilus, a priest of exemplary scholarship and ascetical life. Pamphilus considered himself the keeper of Origen's flame, and Eusebius came in turn to a deep appreciation of the Alexandrian's life and work. Together, Pamphilus and Eusebius, teacher and student, would compose a defense of Origen in six books. Pamphilus kept a loyal devotion to Origen, which Eusebius would imitate in his devotion to Pamphilus. When his teacher died a martyr's death, Eusebius wrote a life of Pamphilus, which he later incorporated into his Lives of the Palestinian Martyrs, which he would finally incorporate into his monum opus, his church history. The very stones of Caesarea formed Eusebius to be an historian. The library of Caesarea surely inspired him to become a writer. Like the great Origen, he had a lackluster style, and was constitutionally incapable of rhetorical flourishes. But again, like Origen, he was a patient and exhaustive researcher, never content until every relevant document had been examined, recorded, and judged. He was true to his Caesarean school in his love for sacred scripture. Eusebius, in the course of his life, would produce many biblical commentaries as well as synthetic works of biblical theology. Though he was Origen's great admirer and defender, he was no big fan of allegory in the interpretation of the Bible. 
He was an historian through and through, and in his commentaries he preferred the literal sense of scripture, and largely left allegory to the side. As he said in one of his books, deeds are plainer than words. One of his early works was an atlas of biblical place names, which he knew well as a resident of the Holy Land. It doesn't get any more concrete than that. Another early project was his Chronicle, which was a summary history of the world. Around the year 290, he began work on his church history. From the beginning, he established extremely ambitious goals for himself, which he set down as his very first words on the very first page. He said, It is my purpose to write an account of the lines of succession of the holy apostles, as well as of the times that have elapsed from the days of our Savior to our own, and to relate the many important events that are said to have occurred in the history of the Church, and to mention those who have governed and presided over the Church in the most prominent parishes, and those who in each generation have proclaimed the divine word, either orally or in writing. It is my purpose also to give the names and numbers and dates of those who through love of innovation have run into the greatest errors. Eusebius was not the first Christian to write a history. In fact, he drew information from predecessors like Julius Africanus. But he was the first to attempt a history with such universal scope and sweep. He begins by recounting the life and ministry of Christ drawn mostly from the New Testament, but also from other non-Christian sources, especially the Jewish historian of the first century, Josephus. He proceeds to trace the careers of the apostles as they went out to all the world telling the good news. It is then that he proves his value to us as he rounds up traditions and legendary materials from many far-flung churches. For many of these accounts, Eusebius provides the only ancient witness that has survived to modern times. He continues to tell the story of the Church through the lives of the early fathers, many of whom will be familiar to listeners of this podcast. Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp of Smyrna, Melito of Sardis, Irenaeus of Lyon, Justin Martyr, and many others. He details persecutions and synods, heresies and rebellions, disputes and reconciliations. Whenever possible, he quotes extensively from primary sources. And he wasn't just retrieving material from the long-ago past. He was also reporting on current events. He told the story up to, and including, his own time. He published the first edition shortly before the year 300, and he continued to update it in the years that followed. Those were, of course, eventful years, and he was not witnessing the action from a distance. He was caught up in the drama himself. In the year 303, the Roman emperor Diocletian called for a sweeping persecution of the church. It began with the burning of buildings, but proceeded to the demand for every individual to offer sacrifice or die. Many of the leading men of the church in Palestine were rounded up, and Pamphilus was one of them. Eusebius stood by his great teacher, and all the while he was in prison, Eusebius worked with him, collaborating on books. When Pamphilus was put to death, Eusebius fled the city and took refuge abroad, eventually making his way to the Egyptian desert. There the authorities caught up with him, and he was imprisoned to await execution. But the torturers never came for Eusebius. Freedom came instead. With the accession of Constantine as emperor, Christians knew true religious liberty for the first time. Eusebius was freed from prison, and he returned to Caesarea, where he was ordained to the priesthood, and soon afterward named the bishop of the city. Bliss it was in that dawn to be alive. For centuries the church had prayed for an end to persecution. For centuries thousands of Christians had gone to their death as martyrs. At last, God had delivered his people. At long last had come the peace of the church. Exhilaration is everywhere in the later work of Eusebius. He was abundantly grateful to God, and he was grateful to Constantine. 
He saw the church's deliverance as an event of biblical proportions, like Israel's exodus from Egypt or the return of the exiles from Babylon. Constantine's victory he saw as miraculous, and he praised the emperor himself in terms that strike modern readers as embarrassingly obsequious. But for this he can be forgiven. He had seen friends go to their death. He had himself suffered the privations and indignities of a Roman prison. His own life had been spared by Constantine's edict. A Christian emperor, moreover, was a new thing on the world scene, and no one was quite sure what to make of the development. Eusebius saw God's hand at work in the successes of Constantine. He believed the new covenant was entering a grand new phase, a worldwide Christian empire in which the God of Jesus Christ was glorified from the rising of the sun to its setting. Eusebius believed the Christian emperor's authority should extend beyond secular matters to include the sacred as well. He attributed to Constantine a power over the church as well as the state. He was the first to set forth this imperial theology, but not the last. Later, historians coined a term for the phenomenon. They called it Caesaropapism, the investing of secular rulers with spiritual authority. As bishop of Caesarea, Eusebius was an influential figure in the newly legalized church. In 318, he received a visit from a very controversial priest who had just been expelled from the church in Alexandria. The priest's name was Arius, and he laid his case before Eusebius. Reviewing the evidence, Eusebius judged Arius' doctrine to be orthodox, and so placed himself squarely in opposition to Alexander, the bishop of Alexandria. It's quite possible that Eusebius did not agree with Arius' doctrine. It's possible that he merely opposed what he saw as excessive verbal fine-tuning of an ineffable mystery. He worried that by forcefully opposing Arius, the Alexandrians were overreacting, and thereby avoiding one heresy by embracing another. When Constantine called the bishops in council in Nicaea in 325, Eusebius opposed the use of the word consubstantial to describe the relationship of the father and the son. But the Alexandrian party prevailed, and Eusebius accepted the doctrinal conclusions of the council. But they didn't sit well with him. In the years that followed, he sat among the leaders at two local synods that favored Arianism. He was among the bishops who agitated for the deposition and exile of two champions of the Nicene faith, Athanasius of Alexandria and Eustathius of Antioch. Eusebius gave aid and comfort to the bishop who most successfully championed Arian doctrine, the social climbing bishop of Nicomedia, who was also named Eusebius. He also wrote broadsides against his fellow bishops who taught that the divine son was consubstantial and co-eternal with the father. In fact, he may have been the advisor most responsible for the emperor Constantine's periodic slides into the Arian camp. Again, it's quite possible that Eusebius did not himself accept the Arian doctrine, but he was certainly among those bishops who thought that striving for precise language was an affront to the divine mystery. He counseled accommodation, concession, compromise, a big tent in which all parties could dwell, no matter what they believed about the nature, eternity, and identity of Jesus Christ, the Word. Eusebius favored creedal formulas that were vague enough to mean one thing and its opposite at the same time. And men like Athanasius were never going to settle for that kind of pretense. So Athanasius became the problem, and Eusebius apparently worked to eliminate this problem from the hierarchy. This will be his enduring shame, because Athanasius saw the matter clearly, and Eusebius was simply wrong. The church could not accommodate, on the one hand, believers who held that Jesus was true God from true God, and on the other hand, those who thought he was merely a creature. Whichever party was wrong was very wrong. Athanasius stood in opposition to Eusebius on other matters, too. 
Athanasius respected Constantine and was grateful for his favors, but he never warmed to imperial ecclesiology as Eusebius did. For Athanasius, sacred authority rested with the successors of the apostles, not the successors of the Caesars, and most especially with the Bishop of Rome. The papacy was, for Athanasius, the apostolic throne, the legitimate judgment seat for the entire church on earth. But Eusebius won the emperor's favor. Athanasius spent long years in exile. Eusebius's reputation grew as he produced useful works of apologetics against traditional Greco-Roman religion. In his book Preparation for the Gospel, he argued that the works of the pagan philosophers all bear testimony to the coming Messiah. In his book Demonstration of the Gospel, he showed that Christ fulfilled hundreds of prophecies recorded in the books of ancient Israel. In a later work titled Theophany, he combined the evidence of both earlier books into a single volume and a tighter argument. These were useful books, as was his ongoing project of the church history. Eusebius earned the respect he received in the 4th century. Indeed, whenever the emperor passed another milestone anniversary, the court summoned Eusebius to the celebration to deliver fulsome praise. He did this at least three times, for the emperor's 20th anniversary and 30th anniversary, and then upon his death. In the oration for his 30th anniversary, Eusebius compared the emperor at length to Jesus Christ and paid homage to his holiness, proclaiming him the only man who, quote, is free, nay, who is truly Lord, above the thirst of wealth, superior to sexual desire, victorious even over natural pleasures, controlling, not controlled by, anger and passion. Hence is our emperor perfect in discretion, in goodness, in justice, in courage, in piety, in devotion to God. He truly and only is a philosopher. Nowhere do we find a hint that Constantine had had his eldest son Crispus seized and put to death. Nowhere is it mentioned that he had had his wife Fausta suffocated in a sauna. Eusebius went so far as to remove every mention of Crispus and Fausta from his otherwise comprehensive church history. We know nothing about the final days of Eusebius. We don't know quite when he died. It is one of the ironies of history that the only known biography of Eusebius, written by his hardcore Arian successor as bishop, is now lost to history. But what he achieved was nothing less than great. He is rightly called the father of church history, though many historians decline to call him a church father. Still, no less a scholar than Johannes Quaston identifies Eusebius as the beginning of the golden age of patristic literature. Christian historians and history buffs are permanently in his debt. Without him, we would know very little about the early centuries of the church. We would have few documents with which to feed our curiosity and devotion. St. Jerome acknowledged that his own Dictionary of Christian Biography, set down in the 5th century, was largely cribbed from Eusebius. It is no exaggeration to say that all subsequent church history is based upon, dependent upon, the church history of Eusebius. This podcast certainly is. Now, before we go our separate ways, I'd like to ask a favor of you. I want very much to keep up these podcasts and spread the message of the fathers. But like most nonprofits and most businesses, Catholic culture has suffered a major setback during the current coronavirus pandemic. A donor has come forward and offered to help us through by matching any and all donations up to $100,000. So anything you send our way will bless us twice. CatholicCulture.org is run by Trinity Communications, a nonprofit organization, so your donations are tax deductible in the United States. Donations can be made by credit card, PayPal, check, or in the form of stock. So please go now to our donation form at CatholicCulture.org slash donate slash audio. We pray for our benefactors every day. I thank you for listening. De quorum solemnitate 
Gauden Tangeli Er kollaudant filium Dei Way of the Fathers is just one of the podcasts produced by CatholicCulture.org. To hear more from the Church Fathers in their own words, check out Catholic Culture audiobooks, readings of Catholic classics, including the Fathers and St. John Henry Newman. You might also enjoy Criteria, the Catholic film podcast. It's a film club devoted to works of high artistic caliber and Catholic interest. And for interviews on a wide range of topics in Catholic arts and culture, listen to the Catholic Culture podcast.